Cheers. Welcome back to Adventures, Adventures in Beer Selling. So I'm a huge fan of Game of Thrones. If there was a few things in this world that I could run back, in, in TV world that I could run back, it would be the last couple of seasons. But all in all, it is a great show and a great story uh, written by George R. R. Martin. Something that kind of grinds my gears about Game of Thrones is the story behind Dorne. Dorne, I was just wanting so much out of that place. And we got so little out of the TV show. Now, in the books, I know there's a much more expansive story. Um, but that wasn't really portrayed in the show. And I really wish they would have just blew that story up. Why do I like Dorne so much? I'm from the South and it's in the South. But when I first started watching the show and looking at Dorne and then sub subsequently reading, going back and reading some of the books about Dorne, I thought to myself, and I know, I know, George R. R. Martin made a show based on his own imagination and the things that he was interested in. So I'm, this, isn't, this isn't an attack on him and his writing. It's just something that I wish it would have been, and I'm going to explain to you why it would have made it better. The people of Westeros, right? You've got this big island, kind of like England. And you got the Northerners, you got the Westerners, you got the Stormlands, you got all these different groups of people. The people in the South, Dorne, they should have been black. I'm not, I'm not, they should have been black people. Black to mixed race people, right? Because I just think it would have made the show so much better. I'm going to give you three reasons why I think that would have made everything so much better. I, I don't know that this proves anything. I don't know. This definitely doesn't change anything. But I am just giving you my own complaint. I just feel like that would have been amazing to add to the show. So three of my reasons. The first reason is uh, a reason that some people will like it when I say it. Some people will hate it when I say it. But you just listen to why I'm saying it. That is diversity. So why am I mentioning diversity? Because House of the Dragon, another great show, they've given us diversity. They've given us black Valarions, right? Who in the books are not black, but in the show they are. Because that's not the kind of diversity that I felt was all that great. Why? Because it seems kind of pandering. Uh, you know, black people with the white hair. And it's just, it just seems a little awkward. And it seems like you're pushing this idea of, hey, hey, look, look, we're going to put we're going to put some cool, cool looking black people in here. Right. Whereas with Dorn. I feel like it would have been more natural. It could have made sense. Um, geographically, Dorne is in the south. It's a hot, arid region. The people that came into Dorne, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, they had a um, obscure kind of journey to get there. Setting of Dorne, the dress, the way they dressed. I know they were kind of going for this medieval Spain kind of Arabic look, um, which is cool. And I think that worked also. The, the way they dress feels more colorful. The culture, it could have really fit an African type of vibe. There's three types of Dornishmen in the books, right? Um, and we're talking about the people as a whole. You have the, the salty Dornishmen, and these are the people with the most foreign identifiers, right? The salty, the salty Dornishmen. So they live close to the coast. They're the furthest south. These could have been like the true um, African looking featured people, you know, it has some people like me in there, right? And then you had the Sandy Dornishmen. Now these people are um, kind of live in the arid region in the deserts and they're a little more swarthy, I guess is the right word you would put, right? These could be like kind of like mixed race looking people, right? They, they they're gonna have like the darker skin, but not not maybe not as dark 
as the salty Dornishmen. And then finally you have the stony Dornishmen. These people live in the, uh, in the mountains and um, they are the most visibly similar to the Andals and the First Men, right? And these people could have that light mixture. Um, you could, these could be like the Drake, <laughs> they could be like the Drake looking brothers over here, the Rashida Jones, or what, what's her name? Uh, um, yeah, Rashida. These are the people like, yeah, you know, I might be a little mixed with something, but you still probably wouldn't say whatever have them more in the mountains because they're more um, mixed in with the Andal culture. So my first reason is if you wanted to put diversity into the show, that to me was a much more clear cut, not pressing uh, way to add it into the show or into the story. Like I, again, I go back, George R. R. Martin wrote this story. He wrote it based on what he wanted things to look like, it's all his business. I'm just putting my two cents in as if it was mine, what I would do, you know? And I would totally write. I don't, I, could, I don't know if I could totally write, but I would try to totally write a Game of Thrones story with the knights and everything and have them look like a bunch of Englishmen and Frenchmen and then have the Viking looking people. And then I would bring in the brothers in the South. I think it's perfect. My last thing about diversity is, let's talk about aesthetics. It is a brilliant contrast to what you have in the North. The North is like super cold, so white they got the white walkers up in the North, right? <laughs> like that's, that's how they're rolling. So it's a big contrast to the South. In the same aspect, it's a huge contrast to the Valerians, the Targaryens. So they come from this far away land and they have a very distinctive, different type of look than the uh, rest of the Westerosi. Here are the Dornishmen who trace their ancestry to the Roynar. The Roynar are from Essos and they lived along the Roin River. Same thing, very foreign, but have them have a completely different look from the Targaryens. So I, I think those two contrasts would have been brilliant for the show. There's also these people called the um, the orphans of the green blood, people that read the books. Please correct me on anything that I say is wrong because I have read, but I've like lightly read the books, so I'm not experienced at all. I just know a ton about Game of Thrones as like a junkie and a nerd, not as an expert. But the orphans of the green blood have have not been engulfed by Westerosi and old first men culture. They are 100% true to Roynar culture. I mean, I just feel like it's another aspect that just shows the wider universe of what Game of Thrones is and all of the different ethnic groups and people. So I feel like uh, diverse, I think that's the way you go about diversity in Game of Thrones. So my number two thing is the story of the Dornishmen has so many parallels to um, other cultures that are, you know, African cultures, right? So what's the story of the Dornishmen? So you have, um, they lived in Essos, they lived alone along the Roin River, and they uh, lived pretty peacefully in all these little city-states, right? So, uh, you know, you picture like um, Athens, Sparta, all that stuff, these little small states that all have their own little governments and their own way of running things. And they all live together pretty much in peace until uh, the Valerians start pushing in on their territory. So they end up in this huge war against the Valerians and the Valerians are coming with their dragons and they're sh dropping fire bombs on them. But the Roinar have uh, water magic. Remember, I said there's big contrast between the Valerians who are from the east and the Roinar who are from the east. There's huge contrast even in their cultures, even though they're from basically the same direction, we'll say. So they use their water magic to fight off the Valerians. They lose most of the battles, but they're putting up, I, I want to say it's like 200 years of of back and forth fighting between the two groups. 
they finally amass an army. They join together and they amass an army. They march on, um, I believe, one of the Valerian free cities and uh, they like wipe out a Valerian army of 100,000. And they just, they just, they just, they just destroy them. So then the, Valer the Valerians send um, 300, I think, dragon riders and they just destroy everything. So this is when Princess Nymer Nymeria gathers the Roinar people and they leave and they are tr they travel away from Essos to search for a new home. Um, great story. I, I will admit their story parallels so many different types of uh, people in the world. I mean, the, you know, the Jewish diaspora, the African diaspora, um, the Romani people, the way traveling and fleeing uh, warfare, fleeing persecution, a good parallel, I should say, of, of, the, of the diaspora uh, uh, and how, I mean, it's not exactly the same story, but so many different groups have um, either been transported away you know, unwillfully, and so many other groups have uh, willfully left. So I, I think the migration is a really, really great parallel for the African diaspora. I know that there's a much deeper story about um, Nymeria and her travels, but um, the idea that these people were super resilient in the stories, like they go to all these different places and they try to stay and they have different little adventures. I think that mirrors a lot of different cultures. So another thing that uh, I would say parallels, on my second point, parallels with the African experience is they're very unique amongst the seven kingdoms in their culture. They are a part of the seven kingdoms but they have this very distinctively different culture uh, from the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. And, and everybody, all of the Seven Kingdoms have their own kind of culture. The North, they have a way that there are that's, that's unique. The, the Crown Lands, the Storm Lands, they all have these unique words and sayings, but there's a kind of like a streamline um, culture amongst all of the other six kingdoms that kind of falls in suit. Um, the way in which they view bastards and all of the other kingdoms is very negatively, whereas in Dorne, it's, it's, that's not really a big deal. They have, a, they have a unified culture in the six kingdoms, whereas the Dornish have something that's slightly a little bit different. That's kind of how it is anywhere you go in the world. Anywhere you go in the world, there's like a mainstream culture and then wherever you have black people that have congregated and created a community, they're a part of the mainstream culture, but they also have this unique difference uh, that sets them apart from the other cultures. And a lot of times it's a driving force for the other culture. Let me think of an example. Um, how about like uh, New Orleans, right? Um, so you have American culture. When you ask somebody, what's American culture? They're going to talk about uh, Hollywood. They're gonna talk about the hustle and bustle of New York. They may even talk about the Midwest and, and cowboys and stuff like that. But there's this little place in the South that is really unique from everyone else. It's still very American, but it stems from something totally different, the way they play music. They celebrate holidays that they don't celebrate everywhere else in the world. They talk, their accents, I mean, everywhere in the United States has a different accent, but New Orleans accent is very distinctively different. It's almost something that is from somewhere not American, right? It's very distinctive, even though it is an American culture, it's something that's kind of a little bit different. The combinations of food, the food in New Orleans is incredible, but it's also something that's very uniquely uh, from New Orleans, very uniquely Louisianan, you know? So 
Dorne represents that same kind of parallel of a place that's a part of Westeros, but it's got its very own unique and distinctive culture that's very different from that of the Andals and the First Men. There is some super strong female energy going on in Dorne. Shout out to the ladies. The way in which they view women in Dorne, they're much more empowered than they are in the other kingdoms of Westeros. And if you look historically, and let me just say this, I mean, in other cultures too, women have been empowered. Uh, Catherine the Great in Russia, and obviously Queen, the first Queen Elizabeth uh, wielded quite a bit of power. And so it's not to say that it hasn't, um, that, you know, we're the only ones that are giving off this female energy. But there is something that's very distinctively African about um, women holding authority. Um, even in my own culture, um, amongst the Akan groups, the way in which descent is placed, so most people, it's patrilineal, right? And male primogenitor. Hopefully I'm saying that right. That means that the king son becomes the next king. Well, in Akan culture, it is matrilineal. So it is still male primogenitor, but it passes from the king to the king's sister's son. And they trace that lineage all the way back up to a, like a founding woman. So there's a founding queen mother. And amongst the cons, the queen mothers hold quite a bit of power. Yes, it's still male, male dominated, right? But the uh, woman's role is very, very important amongst the Akan, and that is how they pass down kingship. So female energy, female um, empowerment uh, within Dorne is very unique with the Dornish outside of the other Westerosi cultures. Remember Princess Nymeria is the one that led her people. She did marry into the Martell family. Her, uh, I can't remember his name, but she married a Martell. They became the House Martell. But the head of that house, it does not go from male father to son. It goes from oldest sibling. So it could be a girl. Um, in the books, Princess Ariane is the heir to the throne of Dorne. So there's a, there, there's a lot of similarities. So one last uh, parallel, and it made me think about it, talking about the Akan people. One last parallel I want to make a connection with is there is a, an Akan group called the Baoli, and they are um, from the Ivory Coast. Um, the Baoli, Baole are um, a part of uh, this, the Akan group I was talking about where we traveled from the north to present day Ghana. They were a part of that group, um, which would later splinter into several different tribes. When um, there was a succession crisis amongst the Ashanti people, Queen Abla Poku fled because her brother was in line for succession to be king of, Ish of Ashanti. Well, he was killed. And this is the story. She fled uh, away from Ashanti in fear of her life and took many of her followers with her. As the story goes, she came to the Komowe River, river and um, the river was too high to cross and they needed to get across to get away from, I'm, I'm assuming, the pursuing uh, Ashanti army. Well, uh, she consulted the wise men and they said that there needed to be a, a great sacrifice in order to cross the river. And if I can remember the story right, she sacrificed her baby boy to the river and alligators of uh, crocodiles or hippos lined up and allowed her and her people to cross the river into safety and so the term for their 
tri baole uh, it roughly translate into ba which is child the child has died or the child is dead that's what it roughly translates to and that's the name of the people so um i bring this up because here is a queen or a princess actually she would have been a princess here is a very tumultuous situation that she's in it's a succession crisis where um anybody who is the loser and related to the loser may lose their life and here's her leading her people to a new home and um the Baoli people still exist in the Ivory Coast today but here are a group of people that have come with a little bit of a different culture and settled there and become part of it led by a strong female hero so just a lot of parallels between the actual culture in the diaspora and uh, the Dornish people. My last point about this um, is kind of what I started off at at the beginning. And I know people are like, why do you even care about this? I don't, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know why I do the things that I do. I just do them. But <sighs> the story of Dorn in the show, it was so flat. I mean, when they presented Dorn, the the setting and the scenery and the the vibrant outfits that they were wearing, and I mean, they, but the actors and the, they were awesome. They were absolutely awesome, and they just gave us nothing. Like there were there was just nothing on the line with Dorn. It was like like they killed Dorn Martell, and I, it just it just it, none of it really hit and honestly it didn't really make sense it's like here's this random uh paramour of Ober Martell she's gonna kill the prince and they're everybody's just gonna fall in love. like nah come on man it just it was such a flat story and maybe it would have still been flat with some black folks in there but I mean I just feel like having some different types of people uh, it may have brought, it may have energized the story a little bit. Now, with that said, as much as it would pay me to lose Pedro Pascal, if there was some way to keep him, <laughs> like Pedro, we had to invite you over to to our side and you know claim you for a few seasons. Uh, he's such a great actor. Uh, I definitely would hate to lose him uh, as Oberyn Martell. However. Um, I just think having some of those characters um, look a little bit differently, I thought that would have been just so cool. I mean, just imagine Arthur Dane, um, and now he would have been more on the lighter mixed race side, but imagine him like Arthur Dane and Ashara Dane, and not just, again, it can't just be for my selfish reasons that they are have a little color to them. I mean, they also have to expand on those stories. Ashara Dane, you have to expand on her story. And the other thing is that the, the Dornish have connections with Essos. And how that could have played a factor, I think, would have been awesome. Um, Ober Martell's been everywhere in the world. He Remember, he talked about seeing the, um, the Unsullied fight. And I just feel like somebody that traveled, it would have been nice if they were... Uh, it would have been interesting. Uh, maybe their interactions with certain characters would be different if they had that similar uh, look. It would have created this connection to the outside world, outside of Westeros, where their involvement and monitoring of what Daenerys was doing, their monitoring of what's going on in all of Essos, and Honestly, I think it would have driven that wedge that was there. Remember, the Dornish were really pissed off at the Lannisters and they really had a beef with them. But throughout the history of this Game of Thrones universe, they've always been the group that's been on the outside. Uh, they were the only kingdom not conquered by the Targaryens and still held their title of prince and princesses because they 
they didn't view themselves as uh, a part of the seven kingdoms until they were married into the seven kingdoms. The mad king, he didn't like the fact that uh, Rhaegar was marrying into the Martells, marrying one of the Dornish people. He looked down on them. That's a, I think that's in the books. He looked down on them. He didn't like them. I'm not saying them being black would have been because they were black, but again, it's about them being unique and different and kind of not really a part of Westeros culture. The Mad King probably didn't like it. He just, he's a Mad King. I mean, it's his name. But the fact that they were kind of on the outskirts, I just think it would have just powered the story even more. But, you know, they didn't. Whatever. It's all good. The story's still great. I wish um, the last couple seasons could have been better. Um, but I really, really enjoyed it. And I've always, it's just always been something that's been on my mind. Like, why didn't he make the Dornish people black? But maybe there's hope. George R. R. Martin, give me a call. I'll write Sotheros for you. And then we'll, we'll we'll have our own deal. But anyways, I'm going to enjoy this beer. I don't even know why I put this together. But I start thinking about things and I say, hey, I'm going to tell you guys. Like, subscribe, keep viewing, keep looking out for more content. Check out the podcast on all platforms, Spotify, all that stuff. You know, you know where it's at. And, uh, and continue enjoying, enjoying beer. Valor Mogulis.